Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Daniel Byman. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution and a professor at Georgetown. Uh, as everyone watching the session knows, the Middle East has long been an area of both conflict and competition with states meddling in the politics of one another, trying to destabilize one another, and otherwise engaged in very fierce efforts to try to weaken rivals. And it's not surprising that this competition in recent years has spilled over into the social media realm. We've seen extensive efforts of regional governments to use these new tools against each other and against their own internal opposition. And I'm delighted today that we have a fantastic panel for you to discuss this problem and to discuss ways that the situation might be improved. Um, I'm going to be very brief on the introductions of all our speakers. What I would note is that we have full, full bios available on all the speakers at the event page at the Brookings Institution website. And I urge you to see the, the really amazing uh, set of accomplishments our speakers have. Um, our first speaker is Dina Hussein of Facebook. She's the head of counterterrorism and dangerous organizations for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, I would like to point out that um, uh, Facebook, and I should say Meta, excuse me, uh, provides uh, generous support for the Brookings Institution China program and helps make the work we do possible. I'd like to reiterate Brookings' commitment to independence and underscore that the views expressed today are so, solely those of the speaker. Um, uh, she is joined by Alexander Siegel. She's a non-resident fellow here at Brookings and a professor at the University of Colorado and so has done extensive research on social media. Uh, we also have um, Afaf Abrogi. Uh, she is a researcher who has done um, considerable work with civil society in the region, um, offering assistance uh, to mission-driven individuals and organizations in their efforts in this space. Um, and our final speaker, is Chris Messerol. He is the Director of Research of the Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Initiative at Brookings. Uh, so let me kick things off with uh, Dina. Uh, can you set the stage for us, please? And can you tell us uh, what Facebook is seeing in the Middle East and North Africa region with regard to kind of malign state activity? Yeah, absolutely. First off, I'd, I'd like to thank Dan and Chris and the Brookings team for the invitation. It's always such a pleasure to engage with you all in this kind of dialogue. Um, as Dan mentioned, we have been covering all a, a good amount of work in the Middle East because my team covers the globe, but I specifically head up Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And I can speak to the work that we've been doing over the last three years, um, where we've seen that the evolution of the utilization of social media by states has really stemmed from the fact that they are now able to understand the inner workings of both the tool, but the policies at play as well behind these social media platforms. So I'm going to start off by just giving us a, a very brief intro to the way that our policies work. Our policies are really built around two things, content and behaviors. And as there has become an evolution of the understanding of that twofold approach, we've seen that state actors have abused the platform when it comes to content in that they are showcasing and, and sharing information that might not be accurate or um, pushing forward info, info ops at a larger scale that we had, than we had been seeing beforehand. We're also seeing that when it comes to behaviors, things like account integrity exploitation, such as hacking or purposefully locking somebody out of their account has started to peak a little more. We're also seeing the coordination of inauthentic or slightly authentic behavior on the platform as well that is state back. And then finally, something that is obviously at the forefront of all of our minds, it's contracting of private actors that are then doing um, doing or taking on malicious activity on the platform. Or um, in certain cases, and this is applicable across the globe, but does manifest in the Middle East, utilizing jurisdictional um, legal vagueness in order to get platforms to legally remove content, um, which is another way that we're seeing this. So it's four different types of abuse, but they're manifesting in very interesting ways. Great, thank you. That's a great overview to begin our conversation. Um, Alex, can I turn to you? Um, I know you've studied states in the region and how they've used social media uh, to target their own opposition, among others. Uh, can you discuss how effective this has been? 
Sure. Thanks, Dan. And again, thanks to the whole Brookings team for having me. It's great to be here today. I think the way I think about this is sort of what are the levers of control that are available to states on these online platforms? And I think Molly Roberts has this very useful framework where she talks about fear, flooding, and friction. And I think a lot of the um, specific instances that Dina brought up fall nicely into these categories. But if we start with fear, that encompasses things like both surveillance of opposition and everyday citizens, as well as the use of physical repression to curb online dissent. A lot of this is done under these really vague cybercrime laws, and there's kind of two dimensions of this, right? One are the laws within each country. So just to give an example of what the language involved in this kind of legal infrastructure looks like in Saudi Arabia, uh, this is the idea that people could be jailed, for example, for posting any content that, quote, unsettles the social and national fabric or any actions that touch the unity and stability of the kingdom under any reason and in any form, right? So you see how vague this language is that just instills this kind of underlying sense of fear that people could be and are um, prosecuted and physically repressed for their online activity. There's also kind of interesting developments around using the language of Western platform content moderation in the legal infrastructure in these countries, for example, accusing opposition activists of spreading misinformation or hate speech and using the kind of very language that you often see platforms and policymakers using to try to keep um, platforms safe against opposition and to target opposition. Um, on the flooding side, this is where the coordinated and authentic activity that Dina is mentioning comes in. And here the idea is that rather than censor opposition language or activity on the platforms, regimes can either produce their own bots, trolls, sock puppets, other kinds of inauthentic accounts, or hire them. We've seen this kind of explosion of digital mercenaries or sort of disinformation for higher kind of um, outlets cropping up that are used to flood the online environment and drown out opposition voices. And then on the friction side, this occurs both at the infrastructure level, but also at the network level, the idea that regimes can restrict access to the internet itself, to specific platforms or to content. And I think on the one hand, we think of this as sort of an older blunter approach that we saw in the early days of the Arab Spring in the region, but it's still going on today. Some recent examples include um, Egypt, throttling access to Facebook during 2019-2020 protests. Um, Jordan had some national internet shutdowns and restricted Facebook Live during recent uh, teachers union protests. Um, and we've seen a lot of in sort of larger scale internet shutdowns in Yemen, both by the Houthis and more recently seen the Saudis actually targeting telecom infrastructure um, to silence information coming out of Yemen. So these kind of three categories of fear, flooding, and friction, I think do a good job of laying out kind of the authoritarian toolkit. And I'm happy as we go on to talk about the success um, of these different approaches. But what we often see is I think at the same time regimes advance their ability to control online information, opposition actors also find new ways to use the tools to achieve their goals. So I hope today we can talk a little bit about kind of the, the back and forth there as well. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Alex. And that's uh, actually a perfect segue to a fab who I'm going to ask basically that question, which is, uh, can you discuss how all civil society actors view this sort of state activity um, and attempts at whether it's influence or surveillance? You know, how does this affect their efforts? And, and what have they done in response to these aggressive campaigns? Thank you very much, Dan. Um, so basically, of course, the use of these digital oppression tools and tactics, including surveillance and disinformation and manipulation campaigns online is, is a constant threat that, uh, uh, that civil society organizations and uh, human rights defenders in the region have to, have to grapple with. And, uh, and, and uh, that's how they see it. It's, it's this existing threat uh, and risk that uh, 
they need to continue grappling with while trying to continue to work uh, in a in a very uh, repressive and uh, authoritarian uh, authoritarian environment. And the way it's been affecting affecting uh, their efforts, it's based. On, I want to talk a little bit about about surveillance because it's been uh, it's been covered a lot lately uh, in the news and uh, particularly the use of the uh, NSO uh, that uh, had several governments in the region to target uh, civil society organizations, to target their uh, opponents, to target dissidents, and most recently, Frontline Defenders uh, published a report where it, it uncovered the use of that spy whereby they get pain and uh, Jordan to target uh, women human rights uh, defenders. Uh, so surveillance in particular has, has a chilling effect because it, it facilitates the gathering of uh, very sensitive information that these uh, civil society organizations hold, uh, sensitive information that could be about uh, the people that work at their own organization and who may not want to, to, to appear publicly that they are associated with such organizations because it's a very, very risky uh, environment, but also... Uh, gathering information about witnesses, about uh, sources, uh, and using also some of that information in, uh, in sham uh, trials, but also to target these uh, organizations, either online, in online campaigns, or uh, but also in the mainstream media. Um, so what we, in the past, I mean, years, like with, with, the, with the proliferation of uh, these uh, spying and surveillance campaigns and combined, like these tactics combined with, uh, with, with the offline tactics, uh, including the judicial harassment, but also imprisonment of activists and, and the restrictions on, on their rights to, uh, on their rights and freedoms that are essential to, to, to their efforts, uh, like uh, freedom of expression and information, but also uh, the, the right to protest, the right of the freedom of assembly and, uh, and, and association. These tactics have contributed greatly to the shrinking of the civic space in the region, and in some cases, it's, it's uh, de decimation. Uh, in terms, so, so these are the, the impacts uh, in terms of how they have been adapting. I'd like to talk a little bit about how uh, digital rights organizations have been trying to support CSOs uh, to adapt because this is, this is the, the background that I, uh, uh, that I have. I work as a digital rights uh, uh, consultant and a researcher with the Social Media Exchange, a digital rights organization in the region. And in the past year, what we've seen, we've seen an interest from organizations and others in providing uh, digital security support to, uh, to these organizations to help them deal better with, uh, with these uh, threats, uh, either in terms of detecting, detecting these attacks, detecting breaches and detecting threats, but also in terms of providing uh, emergency uh, support to deal with such, uh, with such, uh, uh, with such threats. And the other, uh, the other tactic or the other way that these organizations have been trying to support uh, CSOs in the region was to try to, uh, to respond to manipulation campaigns, but also to harassment of individual activists and try to coordinate with social media platforms to address, uh, to address these types of uh, campaigns and threats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Chris, let me, let me turn to you for uh, to kind of broaden this discussion beyond the Middle East. Um, you've looked at uh, global trends in this space on the terrorism side, on the digital authoritarianism side. And could you talk about how you feel the events in this region um, are different or similar to broader events you see around the world? Uh, thanks, Dan, and, and uh, thanks to all the great uh, uh, panelists for their con uh, uh, comments as well. But I, I think um, you know, I would build off of what they've been saying to kind of try and contextualize this within a broader um, uh, trend, which is that most of what we're seeing in the Middle East is actually part and parcel with much, uh, you know, much broader issue related to digital authoritarianism and kind of the way that states and particularly authoritarian states are leveraging and exploiting uh, online spaces. And so uh, the two kind of most prominent states in that regard are, are definitely Russia and China. And I think um, in two ways, they've really kind of um, pushed forward with, with new ways of state control and kind of um, developing ways in which uh, regimes can exploit and leverage uh, you know, digital platforms for 
um, you know, greater uh, social stability and control within their uh, countries and, uh, and even abroad. And I think one of those is surveillance, which Jeff uh, did a good job, I think, laying out. Um, these tools provide, uh, especially if you couple them with social media, they, they provide a really um, uh, easy way uh, or easier than any kind of prior technology has made it possible uh, for states to identify uh, and track and monitor um, folks who might have dissident views or who might uh, be uh, you know, developing viewpoints that the regime would view as threatening to them uh, and to their continued uh, survival. Um, the other kind of piece of this, uh, since FF did a, did a great job kind of laying out the surveillance side, um, the other kind of pioneering um, work that a lot of uh, that Russia and China in particular have developed is kind of this notion of influence operations, um, both domestically and, and abroad. And, uh, you know, um, Alex kind of laid out a bit of this when she was talking about flooding and some of the other um, uh, techniques she, she described. But I, I want to make a, a one broad point, which I think is really critical to understanding what's happening in the Middle East um, and ties to these global trends, which is that, uh, you know, we've had propaganda for a while. Um, th that's not something that's new. Um, what is new with these influence operations um, is that they're participatory in nature. And I think people misunderstand exactly what these, you know, these campaigns are really trying to do. They're not, the point of kind of pushing out a conspiracy theory or pushing out kind of um, even something that's maybe a little bit more mainstream, um, but uh, is not necessarily on the fringes, uh, is not to change somebody's mind. It's to instead to, to encourage people um, to you know, effectively confirm their own biases. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you have these online spaces where people are able to kind of comment and like and retweet, et cetera, um, the more you can inject uh, uh, or strengthen narratives that you find uh, conducive to your own strategic interests, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the stronger you'll be in, ter in terms of how you're able to operate on these platforms and how you're able to recruit support, um, both domestically and abroad. And I, I think where this kind of plays into the Middle East, we've, we've already seen it happening. Um, for example, you know, when COVID came out, you saw, um, you know, pro-Iranian accounts kind of saying that COVID was like a creation of the U.S. and that it was kind of, it was literally like they tied it to like Trump as the crusader, uh, that narrative. I don't know that they were really changing anybody's mind about you know, their view of the U.S. or kind of what was happening in the region. Um, it was instead kind of confirming longstanding narratives um, uh, with a, a kind of new twist and getting people, importantly, getting people to participate in that narrative. Um, and I think um, the, uh, you know, one of the most interesting things about it is on the flip side of this is what to do, you know, what can states do to, to clamp down on this kind of behavior? Um, and this is where uh, it, it gets, um, uh, a little bit tricky because especially in authoritarian regimes or areas that are not fully democratic, um, there actually are uses for these platforms within their countries, which is why they're actually reluctant in many cases to shut off access completely uh, to the domestic internet um, and to domestic services uh, or kind of um, uh, to the uh, access to you know, platforms like Facebook or Twitter uh, domestically. Um, because they, they, they gain value from it, but at the same time, they're aware, they're aware that kind of, you know, if, if you're Saudi Arabia, that Iran might be fomenting narratives domestically that you don't like. Um, and one of the things that they're starting to do, in addition to kind of restricting access or, or you know, they're, because they're reluctant to do that fully, is, uh, for example, not only leveraging kind of platforms, policies, but they're starting to pass even new legislation, like Turkey, for example, is trying to or passed legislation requiring um, foreign companies, foreign social media companies to locate personnel within the country. Um, and, and they're kind of effectively turning employees of some of these platforms into, you know, I, this may be undiplomatic, but they're effectively kind of turning them into hostages almost in order to, to pressure the companies into doing the, you know, uh, into monitoring the platform in the way that they would like, um, which is a, you know, uh, uh, a more targeted way of going after, in their view, um, what's happening on these platforms uh, without necessarily cutting them off altogether. Uh, and so you're starting to see kind of 
a lot of experimentation with different ways beyond just crude instruments of just, we're gonna shut the internet off or we're, or we're gonna shut Facebook off. Um, uh, ways in which states are able to maintain the benefits as they see them of these platforms while, um, while also restricting uh, you know, the, the use cases that they're concerned about. Um, and so um, you know, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that, but uh, I think that's a, it's a really alarming trend. I think that's come up in the last year or two that um, is one, uh, you know, policymakers in the U.S. and abroad should really be, be focused on. Uh, great, and uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, really, everyone, for really laying out a, a wide variety of issues. I, I want to follow up on, on some of the remarks made. Um, I want to start with both Dina and Atha on a, a very basic question of, um, given this abuse and the kind of dangerous uh, threats to activists and the broader problems being created, um, you know, how are social media companies like Facebook trying to handle this? And then for a FAF task, um, are there additional things that you would ask uh, these companies to do to be able to protect activists and to ensure that there is better online discourse? Um, so uh, Dina, let me start with you and then go over to a FAF. Sure, thank you, Dan. Um, so I would describe this as a, as a threefold way of addressing these, these kinds of challenges that we're facing. The first for us really is, from an outreach perspective. As we mentioned, um, a lot of the work that we're seeing or the, the, a lot of the work that we're doing really is in addressing who is being targeted, the methodology of targeting, and then as a third and tertiary stream of work is addressing that legislative environment that might be hostile. But the first portion of our work really is outreach to the individuals or the communities or the organizations that are being targeted. When we are aware of any sort of malicious activity, we're trying to give our, the human rights activists on our platform tools in order to securitize their presence on the platform. Now, again, nothing is perfect and we're working to develop more tools, but, but we've applied this not just in the Middle East, we've applied it in Afghanistan during the, the Taliban takeover, we've applied it in sensitive areas like Syria and others. That's the first portion is the outreach to the, to the communities and individuals targeted by us. The second portion of it is operational. So we've built out tools that both through manual review, but also through automation are able to identify malicious action. And we've done that to address both types of ways in this manifest. So if it's content, we're able to do this on an automated level a lot faster. So we've got um, automation that allows us to find pieces of content that we have found to be malicious in some way, shape or form or sharing of disinformation. And we're able to, to backtrack and find who's sharing it, which then leads us to the individuals and the networks and the behaviors. And then a team in on our trust and safety um, pillar that is led by Nathaniel Gleicher. And I have colleagues on there like Olga Bogova who are experts in identifying these kinds of disinformation operations and blacking out the entirety of these networks in one false swoop. And then finally, the very last portion of this that Chris did touch on is we are constantly facing these new legislative challenges. And the way to address that from my perspective really is leaning into transparency from our side. So one of the things that I I'm always very surprised a lot of people don't know about, but I'm always very happy to shed light on is we've started to try and hold ourselves accountable to be more transparent, but the governments that are engaging with us. So if you haven't been able to reach out and check out uh, Facebook's Transparency Center, you'll find that there are two very useful resources. One, the, re the government request for data, for user data resource, where we share the number of requests that we get from each government. But we also found that there is a really very specific type of way that certain governments go about this by restricting things through their own laws. And so another tool that might be useful to you is the content restrictions based on local law tab in that transparency side. And that allows us to not just share what we're doing, but also shed light on the kinds of questions and requests that we're getting. Now, in an in a ideal future, we'd have transparency from governments as well around how they're defining the kinds of very opaque cyber laws that Alex very, very rightly highlighted. But for this, at this point in time, we're trying to do our best to share transparency. So really it's that threefold effective outreach from an operational perspective, securitizing everything and then being very transparent. Thank you. Um, Afef, can I uh, ask you to follow up on this please? Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, there are, there are a few thoughts or a few ways that social media platforms can do a better job in trying to deal with these types of threats that affect civil society organizations. Uh, the first 
is is to really um, do like a better job when it comes to prioritizing these types of campaigns that that uh, that target civil society organizations, but also vulnerable communities like individual activists, uh, individual uh, women human rights defenders who may not have who may not be associated with a certain organization that may help them uh, to reach out to to platforms and to coordinate with those platforms. Uh, I had once a conversation with with a woman activist who who was being impersonated on Facebook. And when she flagged that that page, uh, she got a response that uh, that's that's a public personality page page and it cannot be taken down because she's a public public uh, personality. So that's that's one area. So there is a need to to really prioritize these these types of reports and to maybe coordinate more with uh, other organizations in the region to try to tackle these types of uh, campaigns. Uh, but also to uh, to to prevent the abuse of flagging flagging mechanisms, and this has this is something that has been going on for a while. Some usually uh, these mechanisms can be abused to simply to censor or to silence a certain activist or a certain group, and uh, so many users would be using would be using these this tactic just to to silence and to get the content take, taken down. And that's also important when it comes to content moderation is to pay attention to the uh, socio-political context in the room uh, and to try to put in more human resources and train the content moderators about human rights, about how to moderate content in a human in a human centered way, in a human rights centered with a human rights centered approach to protect uh, the rights of 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 uh, of civil society organizations, those working with civil society organizations, but also with activists. Uh, the other um, the other Two, two thoughts is it's, it's very important to push back on on government demands and but also to conduct due diligence i mean uh social media platforms or technology companies are really interested in expanding their operations beyond western europe and beyond north america and there is a interest in the region and specifically uh the gulf region for example recently or last year Google announced the cloud region in Saudi Arabia, and that raises so many questions about how uh, the data that's going to be hosted in Saudi Arabia uh, is is uh, how it might be abused by by the the Saudi government. And it's really important that companies are transparent about about uh, about the the due diligence that they uh, that they conduct if they conduct any due diligence when it comes to launching new uh, new products or services uh, in the region. And uh, the other point I wanted to share is, is automation. Uh, automation, like, of course, can help platforms and companies deal with this type of content a lot. But we have to remember that a lot of this, these, these tools are not really trained in, in, the, in the context of the region, but also in the languages of the region. And that, and that can, can, can result in the and the removal or censorship of certain content that should not be taken down, while at the same time, hateful speech or disinformation campaign would, would remain on, online. So it's very important to test these uh, algorithms really well and to train them well, but also to be, to be transparent about how these, uh, these, these technologies work and to make sure to provide users with, uh, with, with appeals mechanism to appeal, to appeal those decisions that platforms take. Uh, thank you. Um, Alex, uh, one thing that you kindly offered was to discuss uh, effectiveness a bit more. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you feel is working and, and also if you feel there are certain uh, methods that are not as effective as, as outsiders might think. Sure. So I think sometimes it feels like kind of a strange framing to be talking about, you know, almost giving authoritarian regimes a roadmap, right, for what tool, what tools work for repression or not, right? So I think one way, one way to kind of um, flip this around is to center it on activists and opposition and talk about sort of resilience to censorship and resilience to information control. And I think one of the um, kind of perhaps counterintuitive dynamics that we see a lot, both with censorship of online content, but also um, 
sort of physical repression of activists for their online activities, things like arrests um, or, you know, in some cases even torture in, in the region is that often these sort of more severe and obvious forms of online and offline repression generate a great deal of backlash and even people who might not have been as politically engaged with um, these kinds of issues or politics at all upon seeing, you know, well-known activists with hundreds of thousands of followers get arrested for their online activity may be sort of engaged and, and brought into the dynamic. And I, Jen Pan and I have some work on this where we find that pretty systematically following the arrests of well-known activists and their subsequent release from prison while the activists themselves are sort of diminish their political criticism and online activity for kind of everyday social media users, at least on Twitter. We observe some backlash. We see sort of increased searches, search volume in Saudi Arabia, for example, for these activists on Google Trends as well. So sort of the public and private dimensions of interest and in a variety of other contexts, uh, past research suggests that more obvious forms of censorship of any sort of online content often draw more attention to the very content that regimes themselves may be seeking to hide. I think the place where we've seen less sort of systematic research is around the chilling effects of surveillance, but there's certainly kind of anecdotal evidence and um, I think, you know, many who have been targeted by these operations report um, a big changes in their behavior and a lot of fear. And I think especially the kind of transnational dimensions of this that have been mentioned have really up to the level of fear and the potential chilling consequences of surveillance when we talk about, you know, like the peg Pegasus spyware and other ways of really tracking the day-to-day -day activity of well-known activists and opposition figures. I will say at the same time, being an activist or known opposition figure in these contexts is a very dangerous, um, you know, and, and scary set of activities and brave set of activities to be engaging in in, in the first place. And so, um, you know, it would be interesting to hear more from FF and from others about how kind of surveillance or the authoritarian use of online platforms changes this calculus from just the the day-to-day -day realities of being an opposition or activist figure in an authoritarian regime. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch things over in a few minutes to take some questions from our broader audience. But before I do, I want to ask Chris uh, one final question from me, uh, which is a lot of what we're talking about today is traditionally the realm of governments. Uh, that it's actions by states, some hostile to the United States and its allies, some allied to the United States and its allies. Um, there is a tremendous role for um, the broader, I'll say, you know, European Union policies, your national community in general. Um, what should the response of uh, democratic governments be to all this, um, whether it's with regard to social media companies or helping activists? Um, how do we think about that big question? That's, that's a, a major question. And I think, um, uh, I think there's a, a couple of things I'll say to it, you know, on the one, the first point I'd start with is actually less what they should do and more what they shouldn't do. Um, and that is, you know, there's a lot of pressure and kind of conversation that we should start to fight fire with fire. And, and I would really push back on that, uh, particularly when it comes to information, information operations and influence operations. I don't think democracies win. Um, even if you can gain an advantage in one particular local context or something like that, I, I just, it, I really do not believe democracies win in the long term if we undermine the idea of truth and we undermine kind of um, uh, legitimate political discourse, um, whether it's, you know, uh, domestically or abroad. Uh, and so the, the first point I would make is despite kind of, you know, certain kinds of political inertia that might push uh, democratic countries to think more uh, open-mindedly about some of these uh, more aggressive information operations, I would really push back on the idea that that's the direction we should head. Um, if we're worried about Iran or China or Russia or uh, in the Middle East, you know, Turkey or, or Saudi Arabia and how they're using some of these platforms, I, I cannot, you know, emphasize strong enough that we should not go in that direction ourselves. Um, uh, what we can do, I think, is um, support uh, through, you know, both diplomatically and um, 
you know, diplomatic levers and, uh, you know, frankly, just kind of technical levers, um, you know, the civil society groups on the ground that are kind of at the front lines of this issue um, and the, you know, tech companies them themselves. So, you know, one example would be, you know, I mentioned earlier some of these legislative proposals that are being put on the table in places like Turkey, countries that may not be fully authoritarian, but kind of have some democratic processes. And I think we have some uh, leeway as a country to kind of push hard um, on, you know, uh, you know, I, th I think with a country like Turkey, I think we could exhibit some leverage or, or uh, use some leverage to push back on these kind of proposals about, you know, mandates that uh, countries have domestic um, employees kind of that the, the government can, um, you know, arrest if they don't like certain kinds of content or, or kind of uh, if they want changes to content moderation policies on platforms. I think the, the government can play a more aggressive role in pushing back on some of that, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, in the Middle East or elsewhere. Um, you know, Russia would be the other kind of big example of that at the moment. Um, the, uh, the other thing that they can do, I think, um, would be to strengthen some of the, um, at a more local kind of level, um, or kind of even further upstream in the tech stack, you know, strengthen uh, the ability of civil society organizations to operate outside of uh, the surveillance capa uh, cap capacity and capabilities of some of these uh, really powerful states. And so what I mean by that is um, investing, frankly, in end-to-end -end encryption um, and, uh, you know, certainly not trying to undermine it, but actually kind of actively trying to strengthen those technologies, um, which, you know, I, I realize that's somewhat controversial because there are, um, you know, other uh, considerations and, and there's other stakeholders within democracies that might say, you know, we need to kind of weaken end-to-end -end encryption because, uh, we need, you know, uh, greater access to, to certain kinds of information um, that could contribute to kind of public harms. But I, I would say on the, in the aggregate, we really need to do a better job of uh, creating uh, channels in which dissidents can uh, communicate with each other effectively outside of uh, the surveillance apparatus of, uh, of, you know, powerful states. And so um, I would say, you know, if we're concerned about um, NSO leveraging WhatsApp or other kind of end-to-end -end encrypted um, uh, applications, we should really double down and make it as hard as possible for those kind of states to um, to use that kind of uh, technology. Um, so uh, that's kind of there's other things they could do too, but those would be my big kind of um, uh, points. One, you know, don't fight fire with fire; fight it with you know the, our core values. Uh, um, and to kind of invest in the technologies that allow people at the front lines to really um, uh, effectively operate outside the surveillance capacity of authoritarian regimes. Uh, thank you. I'm going to switch over to some of the questions we've received uh, from, from the audience. And I, I want to start with a question from Mo Saeed, um, which was uh, really asking about some of the um, expertise that is helping a number of these governments, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, others. Um, are they drawing on uh, foreign governments for help? And in particular, um, are they drawing on the United States or other democratic countries for personnel, for individuals who are effectively acting as contractors? Um, and are there, are, are there sensible restrictions that can be done to try to limit that sort of help? Um, I'm not quite sure, frankly, who's the best person to begin tackling this question. Um, Alex, I was kind of thinking of you uh, when I came across the transom, but there may be others who are, are best positioned to weigh in. Yeah, so I mean, I think something that's gotten a lot of attention is kind of the idea that China is serving as an exporter of um, surveillance technology, and they were sort of the original kind of successful internet sensors in, in some way, despite the fact that their infrastructure was very different than what we see in the Middle East, for example. But uh, some of the kind of tools and approaches that they have have been kind of exported in various ways. There's also been, um, you know, a lot of recent journalistic reporting on Israel's role in, um, you know, helping countries in the region um, engage in different kinds of surveillance ac uh, activities of, of activists and dissidents. Um, but I don't, I don't personally have. Um, Kind of much knowledge or, or expertise of, of the U.S. side that the um, that the audience member was asking about. Um, I'm not sure if um, uh, I, yes, please. 
Please go ahead. I mean, I, I have one example I, I can share, which is uh, Dark Matter uh, Group. It's a Emirati-based cyber security uh, company. Well, it's called cyber security, but what it does, uh, what, what it did in the past, uh, probably continues to do now, is uh, targeting uh, human rights uh, defenders in, in the UAE. And uh, the like there were several reports that revealed that ex NSA National Security Agency employees who used to work for the uh, American government were actually employed by by this company, which used their expertise to uh, to spy on uh, human rights defenders and dissidents. So this is just one example I can I can share. Uh, thank you, Chris. I saw your microphone was was briefly turned off to to respond to this. Yeah, I was actually going to cite the exact same example, um, but the, you know, I, I think one to the broader point, one of the reasons we're seeing um, these kind of surveillance technologies in the Middle East in particular is that, you know, the, the model that I talked about earlier that Russia and China have pioneered, it's, it's something that it, it's really going to only be adopted, at least, you know, now um, by states that have significant resources um, uh, and that, you uh, you know, to, for it to work, you need a combination of resources and expertise, basically. Um, and states in the Gulf have the resources. They don't always have the expertise. And in fact, they, they very often do not have the expertise domestically to do this, which means they need to um, bring in that out expertise from elsewhere. And, and so thankfully, you know, after the example that FF just mentioned, you know, I think the U.S. has kind of woken up to the issue and has started to kind of put in place measures to make it harder for former contractors for some of our intelligence agencies to go and work with, you know, work with the Emiratis and others on these. Um, but I think we need to monitor it um, much more closely. I think that's kind of the, one of the main takeaways of NSO and dark matter is that uh, democratic governments, I think need to be much more proactive about ensuring that the personnel of some of their intelligence agencies, when they leave those agencies, don't then go and work for companies that can kind of support uh, authoritarian uh, uh, countries as they try to be, build out these capabilities and capacities. Thank you. Um, uh, to switch gears to another question from William Deere, which is about Israel. Um, you know, it's unusual to have a, a long discussion about the Middle East and not have Israel mentioned at all. Um, and uh, in this context, um, how is the Israeli government handled um, uh, social media posts with regard to the West Bank and Gaza that uh, the government uh, thinks should be taken down. Um, they do have some capacity in terms of using reporting uh, mechanisms of many companies to try to um, uh, spread their message and, and take down uh, those they, they think are wrong. Um, Dina, could you uh, begin by kind of talking about uh, the engagement of Facebook with the Israeli government on these issues? Yeah, I'm happy to touch base on a few of the points that were brought up in the question. So when it comes to our engagement with any government, and this includes the Israeli government, we have public policy personnel that engage with all of, all of the countries in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Some of them are based in country, some of them are not, are based somewhere else. When it comes to our engagement with the Israeli company, the, the Israeli country um, as a company engaging with the Israeli government, we have a engagement that outlines our policies. We engage in the same way that we would engage with uh, partners in the Middle East or in the US to outline an understanding um, of what our policies are, what the restrictions are to the work that we do, and the work around transparency that we also will be doing once we engage around any type of content that's sent our way. Now, across the board, I think it, it's something of interest to, to people watching this webinar. We do have continuous conversations with law enforcement across these countries as well, because it's a two way conversation. We're trying to engage them to, to flag to us anything of concern that might actually be malicious on the platform. But we are aware of the political and the sensitive dynamic there. So to answer the question, yes, we do engage with the Israeli government, but not in a way that is not that cannot be replicated in other countries across the globe. Now, I think the concern here is around preferential treatment. And I think where we are trying to address this is our engagements with any government partner, we are trying to push for transparency. The resources that I mentioned earlier on are a first step around that. Um, I know we can get better there, but it is available to everybody and includes Israel, but, but multiple other company, countries as well. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Keith Hanley about alternative narratives I wanted to ask to, to start off with. 
uh, which is, are there ways, whether it's for the United States or for um, some society actors um, to have their uh, interpretations and their voices elevated to try to correct or at least provide um, you know, more powerful uh, alternative sources of information that are better for informing people. Um, uh, how can we go about doing that um, in your view? Mm, so better for informing people like about, about what in general, about the, like the, the uh, of platforms or? In I, I'm sorry, for better for informing people about uh, whether it's a human rights situation or a political situation or the um, uh, a, a bilateral uh, kind of rivalry situation where the UAE is criticizing Qatar and Qatar is criticizing the UAE. Mm. Are there ways to get more truthful and accurate narratives out there? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are definitely different uh, tactics. Um, I myself, I worked before, before as, as an editor and uh, as an editor focusing specifically on, on, uh, on the intersection of technology and human rights and focusing on how uh, certain policies and practices in relation to, uh, to, to, to this interse intersection affects people. And, and this is one tactic that could be used is to, to use uh, credible reporting, but also to use storytelling for advocacy to tell, to tell the stories of those people who get uh, impacted and the communities, particularly the, the most vulnerable and the most uh, mar marginalized, focusing on the different in intersection. For example, women human rights defenders can face, uh, get, when, when they face these threats, they can, they can face far more serious consequences, for example, than, uh, uh, than, than, uh, than others or minority groups or let's say civil society organizations that work to protect the rights of uh, minority groups. So storytelling, uh, credible reporting, we need more, more stories about these issues. And uh, uh, in the past few years, there, there, there have been a lot of reporting done, uh, done uh, about the practices and policies of, of, uh, of certain governments, but also uh, of platforms. And we need more of those stories uh, coming out from the region. Uh, we've seen that happening uh, last year uh, in relation to, to Palestine and, uh, and, and the Palestinian voices who are being silenced as a result of uh, the implementation of uh, Facebook's policies and, uh, 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 in relation to, to Palestine and Israel. And that kind of helped, telling those stories kind of helped uh, shift the narrative, but also helped to bring, uh, bring uh, some change and uh, some coordination between uh, the platforms and, uh, and, and civil society organizations when it comes to this issue. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Dean, I want to ask you a, a follow on to a point Chris raised about um, thinking about the roles of governments. Um, and in particular, uh, are there things that you would look to from whether it's the United States or European or other governments um, to, to share their own information? Obviously, social media companies have tremendous knowledge of this information space, but a lot of it is comes from other sources. There's a lot of information out there. Um, what do you think is would be useful to learn from government um, in terms of trying to make this problem better? That's a really interesting question, Dane. Um, so I think we to answer that question, we need to take a take a step back and look at the kinds of abuse that we'd like more information around. Right. The initial portion of this is very tactical and the secondary portion of this is a lot more strategic the on the on the tactical perspective as tech companies we have actually come together on a few occasions to address a few types of abuse where we are sharing information and knowledge so for example in in the terrorism sphere that you and chris are very familiar with we've brought together the global internet forum to counter terrorism where not only are we sharing the kinds of baseline best practices that we have we're also trying to understand the kind of abuse and threat. And in that world, we get a lot of debriefs from experts and academics. The Global Network on Extremism and Technology engages regularly with us. It's a, it's a group of academics that are willing to come and share their expertise with, with tech companies. We have been a little bit more sensitive towards engagements, obviously, with governments because of all of the human rights um, implications that have been highlighted. But I do think there is an avenue there for transparency and sharing of that kind of information. So creating bodies where there is an ability to share information and insight, and that requires resourcing that the tech companies should 
participate in, in, in fleshing out. But I do think creating bodies where there, that dialogue is being had about the trends that we're seeing. Because unfortunately, one of the things that tends to happen is we focus on big companies that have a lot of resourcing in order to identify and action these kinds of abuses. But we forget that a lot of people have multiple different apps on their phones and many of them are smaller tech companies that will fall foul of this kind of abuse as well. So that's the first portion of it is creating those forums. The second part of it is I think really expecting that governments will take equal action in the same way that tech companies are expected to. So to use the example of NSO, one of the things that I think was very interesting to see is seeing that commerce added NSO group and other foreign companies and entities to the list of malicious cyber activity actors. So that was an action that I don't think was very precedented and we hadn't seen before. And that allows then tech companies to feel more comfortable in engaging in proportional responses to this. Because at the core of this, one of the things that we're all dancing around here is there, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, there is a difference in power infrastructure when it comes to an individual user versus a state functioning on a, on a platform. And to ignore that power dynamic is to ignore the harmful impact that it then has. So that's where government voice and government action is really important because it sets the tone for proportional response that a company can take. Thank you. That's a, that's, I'm glad you, you put that out there because I think that, that shapes a lot of our discussion today. Um, Alex, can I ask you a question as a researcher, please? Uh, which is, um, are there steps that uh, social media companies could take uh, that would make understanding what's happening in this space much better for, in order for serious outsiders like you to provide uh, some degree of, um, I'll say, insight into these broader problems without having to necessarily rely on governments or companies that have their own um, interests in, in certain answers? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I think often the kind of limitation that external researchers have is we only have these particular public metrics available to us that we can use to try to get a handle on reach and impact of something like, say, a foreign influence operation or the spread of, of online hate speech or you know online extremism, these types of harms. We can measure things like how often were posts on a given platform liked or shared or publicly engaged with in some way, but we're at a loss when it comes to things like how many eyeballs were actually on this content for how long, what types of people were differentially exposed, um, what types of communities online experiences were negatively shaped by a particular you know, coordinated and authentic event online, this sort of thing. And I think understanding the scope of these things requires going much beyond these public metrics of engagement. The number of people that actually click on things or share things or comment on them is a very small subset in most cases of overall kind of exposure. And, and so if we're to understand impact and harm, having more access to data that enables us to get it kind of reach and exposure on these broader stages, I think is one really important place to start. I also think, you know, there, there's this question of who should be the arbiters of what content is allowed on the internet in these diverse cultural contexts, right? And it probably can't be individual governments and it probably can't be individual tech companies, right? And so having um, external actors who are able to um, get, their, get their hands on data in a safe way in order to characterize the harms from hopefully a more neutral perspective, I think is, um, is a pretty important step forward. And platforms have taken steps towards this, right? So one example is um, Twitter has done a really good job recently of when there are takedowns of influence operations, re releasing these data sets that are hashed in a way that protects user privacy, but still gives researchers um, a, a better sense of kind of the scope and content of the operations. Facebook has given researchers access to CrowdTangle, which 
enables them to get some insight into some of these dynamics, but again, not really sort of the, the reach and views that we that um, you might want to see at a more granular level to understand the scope of the harms. But I, I think it's a it's a challenge in the sense that there is so much data and how do you protect user privacy, particularly in these sensitive contexts that we're talking about while still giving external researchers appropriate access to data. And I think kind of negotiating the, the terms of that is an important step forward. And there's been a lot of progress made, I think in the interface between academics and tech companies in making some of this possible, but still a long way to go. Um, Chris, can I turn to you um, again, taking um, your knowledge of outside the region uh, and applying it to the region. Uh, if you look at some of the problems in the greater Middle East today, uh, as, as you know better than anyone, we've, we've seen these techniques and methods used by uh, Russia in the past. And uh, sometimes what, what happens somewhere else in the world shows up in the Middle East a day later, or sometimes it's a year later. Um, are there things happening in this broader issue space that you feel we should be watching and, and preparing for in the Middle East uh, because it's going to be a problem if it's not addressed soon? It's, it's a great question. I, I think one of the um, uh, challenges that I think uh, uh, is coming um, uh, is really this issue of data localization, the kind of splintering of the internet. I think it's kind of, we're at the, you know, to, uh, I didn't want to kind of uh, take the conversation necessarily in, in another direction earlier with my comment about what governments can do, but I know with kind of some of these concerns around, like if you're a regime concerned around influence operations and particular foreign influence operations, one of your instincts is to kind of shut up, you know, shelter your internet, basically take the China model, right? And like, um, you know, create a nationalized internet of some kind uh, that you have full control over. Um, and you know, I think we're on the precipice now of, you know, we've got China, we have uh, the EU, which is increasingly pulling away from the US in terms of their, their understanding of data localization. Um, there's a whole set of uh, court cases known as Trims 1 and Trims 2 that have kind of made it very difficult for um, uh, companies operating in Europe to share information between or data uh, between the US and, and uh, Europe. And I think it's kind of, we're inching towards a world where companies that are global in nature begin to have to have um, uh, effectively like European operations, uh, North American operations, uh, India, depending on how they go in the next couple of years, um, could potentially do something similar. Um, and if they do, I think once you're in a world where, you know, the EU, India, China, and, you know, North America all have kind of different data models, uh, it's going to be hard to see how we don't like the, the rabbit's kind of out of the hat at that point. Um, and I, I'm a little bit worried that we're gonna end up with a world with a lot of different splintered, uh, you know, kind of splinter nets effectively. Um, and it's going to, I think, um, you know, as somebody, even as somebody who's concerned about the ease with which foreign influence operations can take place, um, uh, precisely because of the open and, and kind of uh, fluid nature of the internet, uh, I, I am worried that that will start to appear even within the Middle East, that you'll have kind of, a Saudi internet uh, and an Emirati internet. And you've already started to see a little bit of motion in that direction, but I, I, I don't, you know, as, as concerned as I am about some of these issues, I don't think that's the solution. And I, I, I think it would make it easier for authoritarian regimes to kind of implement some of the more excessive abuses of uh, digital platforms that like Russia and, and China have developed. And so I, I'd be really wary if, if that starts to um, become the dominant mode of thinking within the, within the region too. Dan, do you mind if I jump in there very quickly? Please, I'd be grateful. I'll try, to be as, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I wanted to double down on what Chris was saying because I, I do think it's useful to present the tech perspective here. One of the things that we have noticed is exactly this fragmentation of laws and legislation based on a regional jurisdiction. And one of the things that I do want to emphasize is for certain legal protections, let's say, tech companies are only actually legally required to implement them in a specific region. So GDPR, for example, is a, is a really great example of this. We've chosen to apply it globally, 
But one thing that does tend to happen is with the implementation of one legislation, you see a domino effect. Other, other countries want to apply something similar. And it becomes very difficult for us to, to ignore the fact that these regional legislations that are trying to get at a very specific obstacle in one country then get applied at a global scale. And if tech companies then start to just agree to apply them jurisdictionally, that means that you have two situations occurring. Number one, an imbalance of the protections for global user bases, right? Where certain governments that are not authoritarian, viewed as, de as democratic, are applying these laws and only their citizens get that protection. So there is a need for a global dialogue about this. And, and myself and Dr. Aaron Saltman, who is part of the GIFC tier writing a little bit more around this. But the second portion, portion of this, as well as to, to Chris's point, legislation that might have great intention in one country can then be replicated with malicious intent in another country. And then the tech companies are placed in a position where they have to say, we are going to rank and rate governments and pick and choose whose laws we apply. It's not a situation that I think is equitable or fair. And I, and I don't think anybody wants the tech companies to be ar the arbiters of this, to, to use Alex's descriptor. So I do want to emphasize that number one, regional legislation that then has global impact really needs to be considered. Number two, understanding that when one country applies a legislation, it can very easily be, re be replicated by another country that might not have the, the same intent. And there really isn't a defense against not, not cooperating with one country versus another that doesn't start to get us in some very, very difficult and dicey waters. Uh, thank you, Dina. I think that's a sufficiently important cautionary note for us to end our discussion, a reminder of the incredible complexity of not only the problems, but also potential solutions that people bandy about. Um, it's been really a fantastic um, hour. I want to thank everyone who's watching this on YouTube uh, for joining us today, and particular thanks to our four speakers who I think have provided a fantastic discussion of this very difficult problem. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.